<laughs> in nesting particularly, that he's going to talk about some work he's been doing that will cover both fluid dynamics and human dynamics. Um, Scott. Thank you, Josh. So in preparing for this talk, one of the things that I wanted to do is to communicate what's been fundamental to my research program. And if you look at the bottom of this introductory slide, you'll see the Northern Gulf of Mexico spanning Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. And we have worked for the past couple of decades to try to develop techniques that will allow us to describe the coastal region and the floodplain so that we're characterizing with a high level of accuracy levees, roadways, railroads, any natural impediments to flow and, and any natural and engineered conduits of flow. And I also thought about my introduction in terms of Jai's retirement. And I note that uh, 40 years ago, he would have found himself at the University of British Columbia, right? And at that time, in 1977, the powers of pen came out. I don't know if you remember this. But what the powers of 10 does for us is it allows us to appreciate scales. And I hope that it can allow you to appreciate the complexity of adequately describing coastal regions. Now I'm sure back in 1977, Jai had a few picnics maybe or two but this is not him. But we go from 10 meter square to 100 meter square. And mind you, this is in 1977. And we can begin to see some of a coastline that we may want to characterize you may or may not know where this is. We have to zoom out a little bit further. We're at a kilometer. We're now at 10 kilometers. And you may have guessed it by now, when we get out to 100 kilometers, that we're looking at Lake Michigan in the Chicago region. We're at a thousand kilometers. And at 10 million meters, we encompass the entire globe. So one of our goals with, with my research group anyway, is we wanna be able to describe some very Find features relative to those kind of scales. And we want to have flexibility in our description. So I have some Center for Coastal Resiliency collaborators on the research that I'm going to be presenting today. And most of these folks have been working with me over the last seven years on an ecological effects of sea level rise study in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And we are recently transitioning that into a new study, and, and I'll provide some description of that later on. But again, the point that I want to make here is, if I can find the, uh, oops. Is that we want to transition from a large scale approach we want to think about what our resolution is going to allow us to be able to describe and what it is that we're going to have to parameterize or what's at the subgrid scale that we're not going to be able to describe. 
So if we really want to get down to that level where we're describing this lawn area along Lake Michigan, we have to have a pretty fine resolution. When we began our ecological effects of sea level rise project in, in uh, ecological effects of sea level rise in the Northern Gulf of Mexico project back in 2010, and in fact, when we were writing the proposal or sketching it out in 2008, we were thinking about what are some of the processes that we want to describe and what is it that we want to accomplish with this project. And at that time, there was very little work that was ongoing that was not in the bathtub modeling. That is, the vast majority of the work was taken in an existing digital elevation model, raising the sea, determining how much of that existing digital elevation model was inundated, and then inferring what the coastal response would be. And this was true with hydrodynamics. This was true with astronomic tide flow. This was true with hurricane storm surge flow. And with this and the following cartoon, what I hope you'll agree with me on is that the coast is rather dynamic. And if we raise the sea level, we're going to have changes at the coast. Now we may be able to do beach nourishment and we may be able to protect the coast, but that's going to get more and more expensive. And if we allow the sea level to rise or if we experience sea level rise and we don't do anything at the shore, then the shoreline is going to be eroded away and the infrastructure is going to become more vulnerable. So these features are these characteristics at the coast, whether they're with a marsh or whether it's with infrastructure along the coast, we wanted to build into our modeling system. Further drive that point home, take a look at the green line representing the 1848 shoreline of Grand Bay. At that time, there was the Grand Batour Island. And you'll notice in my talk that I have a little bit of a focus to Grand Bay. I can't present everything that we did in the last seven years, but I can tell a little bit of a story. And in 1848, the Grand Batour Island still existed, but by present day, it's, it's been completely eroded away. And in fact, by 1960, it had been mostly eroded away. And it's one of the reasons that the Grand Bay Marsh in Mississippi, it has one of the fastest rates of marsh edge erosion of any marsh along the continental United States because its protection is gone, because the coast is dynamic. And if we want to model historically or into the future, we need to consider that dynamic system. So our process, has been one that encompasses not just the modeling, not just field experiments, but also from the very beginning within the first three months of our project, we engage stakeholders, coastal resource managers along the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And these stakeholders have added a lot to our project and they've helped to constrain our project in some, to some extent. They've helped us to define global climate change scenarios that we ought to be considering and those that they considered to be unreasonable for their purposes. Why include a 40 meter rise in sea level that's going to occur 500 years in the future if all you're gonna do is turn off your stakeholders because of doom and gloom? Let's try to focus a little bit more on the more near term, maybe going out to about the year <clears throat> 2100 and providing them with information that they can consume and that they can build into their adaptive management strategies. We benefited from an enormous wealth of data as we all do, collected earth data that's been provided and, or that's been collected and it is provided by NOAA and USGS to name just a couple of the federal agencies. We have an integrated, integrated suite of models that produce dynamic results that allow us to make these coastal dynamic assessments 
and our ultimate hope is that with the involvement of our coastal resource managers, ultimately we're going to have some benefit to the coastal ecosystem and society itself. Our project really is a transdisciplinary research project. It has presented transdisciplinary research outcomes. And a colleague of mine, Denise DeLorme, has written a wonderful paper that is included in a recent special issue we did in Earth's Future. And it's all about how we incorporated this into the ecological effects of sea level rise in the Northern Gulf of Mexico project. It's not an easy thing to do. This project started with 10 co-PIs. One of them had to be let go along the way. Managing 10 faculty members is, is always a challenge. Not all of them are really interested in doing interdisciplinary research. But if you stick with it and you work with your strengths, particularly the graduate students, you find that such research can be accomplished and, and can be very fruitful. So before I get into any of the modeling results, I want to make a point that I hope all of you are able to take with you and, and to consider and, and to ponder. Now we all know how valuable LIDAR has been especially those of us that do coastal modeling, that do tide and hurricane storm surge modeling. The improvement over the national elevation data sets that we used to have is, is so dramatic. Going from uncertainties of three to five feet along the coast in, in the upland areas where it up, upper reaches of the floodplains to an uncertainty that's on the order of a foot is a tremendous improvement. But what happens, I think, is that it's such a tremendous improvement that we get blinded by that improvement and we think that the data is perfect. And like any data, it's not. And so we're trying to develop on the one end a very localized marsh response modeling capability and understand that if we're modeling a marsh and, and we're doing this over a decadal period, we still only have accretion rates that are on the order of millimeters per year. So if you don't start the marsh surface as closely as possible as, as to where it's at, you're not going to integrate it forward in time appropriately. And what we demonstrated at the East Point Marsh and at Grand Bay Marsh and at Transex all along the coast and what we're beginning to document in Louisiana is that there are unacceptable levels of error in the LIDAR within the marsh systems and we have to devise procedures that we can use to correct that data. Again, that's important if you focus on the lower left graphic, the marsh platform out of which in this case, Spartina alterniflora grows, is going that, that Spartina alterniflora can only grow, can only function over a period of time if it's between mean low water and mean high water. If it's below mean low water, then that marsh is going to convert to open water. If it's above mean high water, then that marsh is going to convert to upland. It makes perfect sense, right? So, what I would suggest to you as just a simple check is if you can run a transec through a marsh that you're interested in studying, or if you simply run a transec through the LIDAR that you're going to apply and look at it. Is that LIDAR transec between mean low water and mean high water? If it's not, that's your first indication that the LIDAR DEM has some level of inaccuracy that's unacceptable for the work that you're doing. In the project, we developed HydroMEM, or our hydrodynamic marsh equilibrium model. This is a coupling of, in our case, it's an ADCIRC model. It doesn't have to be an ADCIRC model, but that's just what I work with. Coupling of the ADCIRC model with Jim Morris's marsh equilibrium model. 
with this coupling of the ADSERC model and the Marsh equilibrium model, we're able to estimate biomass productivity and accretion rates for a Marsh system. Here's an example in Grand Bay, Mississippi. And so if you look in the upper right of the animated graphic, you'll see the year and the sea level rise for that particular year. We're looking at a two meter sea level rise by the year 2100. Blue, of course, is water. Fluorescent yellow is medium, red is low, and green is high biomass productivity. So as we iterate through time, we're seeing the marsh migrate upland and we're seeing more open water areas created. Now a fundamental part of our project is to put on top of all of this across the three state region, across Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle, hurricane storm surge simulation. So we wanna simulate what is the surge going to be like in the future? What's it gonna be like in 2050 or like in 2100? And if we don't take into account the impact to the marsh system and, and these massive areas of open water that are created, we're not going to represent the floodplain because we're not gonna drive the surge through there like it will now be able to. We're applying HydroMem at numerous places along the Gulf Coast and along the East Coast. One of the more interesting projects that we have right now, we've developed a model that, the, a HydroMem model that's spanning uh, Chesapeake Bay Inlet up to Ocean City, Maryland. So again, the backbone of the work that we do, as Jai said, is the unstructured mesh generation. So for this three state region, Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle, we needed to be able to describe the floodplain up to the 15 meter elevation contour because we wanted to be able to describe hurricane storm surge under a sea level rise of two meters. And we, so we needed to increase the floodplain beyond what it would be today. And we still wanted to have this capacity to describe as in Grand Bay, the tidal creeks. And so we have this ability to um, employ the unstructured mesh and have higher resolution out in the Gulf of Mexico and a very finer, fine resolution in Grand Bay. The model that I work with ADSERC is a finite element model of the shallow water equations and as such, it is a current condition based model. So the smallest element size over the deepest uh, bathymetry is going to drive the time step. And when we have a high resolution like this, our time step is on the order of one second. And we'd like to be able to simulate four to six days of hurricane storm surge we like to be able to simulate at least 45 days of astronomic tides. We do this with high performance computing capabilities. We, uh, we uh, provide, or excuse me, we do uh, domain decomposition on a model like this or on a mesh like this, and we'll decompose it onto 400 to 600 cores, just depending on uh, what we're running. The ADSERC, model frame, ADSERC plus SWAN model framework is relatively simple. I've talked a little bit about the lower left, the ADSERC mesh. I've talked about how the coastline is gonna change with respect to the marsh. We also need to take into account that if I have a two meter rise, I'm going to have a different barrier island configuration or at least dunes on the barrier island than if I have a 30, centimeter sea level rise by the year 2100. Society will be able to do more beach nourishment if we have less sea level rise. But you know, as, as an aside, what I, what I like to tell people is 
think about how expensive that's going to be. Think about the heyday of the United States, post-World War II. All of the infrastructure that we build along the coasts, all of the beach nourishment that we've done up until the present day, and how much we've invested along the coast when we underwent just a five inch rise in sea level, or just a 10 centimeter, excuse me, a 12 centimeter rise in sea level. We've literally best invested hundreds of billions of dollars along the coast, just in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. What is that going to cost if we have sea level rises that are multiples of that, that are order of magnitudes greater than that? But I digress. And the bottom line here is we need to be able to describe future surface roughness. And with surface roughness, I'm meaning not just Manning's end to describe the roughness of the surface to impede the flow of water, but also the roughness of the surface to impede the transfer of momentum from the wind onto the water surface as it's blowing across the floodplain. We need to have astronomic tides built into our model, and of course, we need to have a wind field. And the wind field is, in my opinion, just as key as the actual mesh itself. So we employ this in our modeling system, and we have a different configuration for the marshes for the land use land cover, for the shoreline and the dune morphology, depending on whether I'm dealing with a high sea level rise, present day, low, intermediate low, intermediate high, and again high. And when you see the changes in the colors, when you see a change to a light blue, you're seeing more open water opened up along the coast and more vulnerability to hurricane storm surge. Oops. So what I like to think that we have accomplished in contributing to a paradigm shift away from bathtub modeling to coastal dynamics of sea level rise is not just coastal dynamics of sea level rise, but recognizing what is it that drives sea level rise. It's the temperature variation that we have depending on whether we have a high carbon emission scenario or a low carbon emission scenario. So if we have a high carbon emission scenario, we're gonna have a higher average temperature. We're gonna generate more sea level rise. Now, what our system doesn't take into account, but can, what we haven't modeled as of yet, is what's gonna happen if the Antarctic ice cap starts to break up like uh, we've seen some recent articles in the New York Times about. What's gonna happen if we have huge amounts of ice breaking off of its shelf and in, in, into the ocean, and we have less than a smooth rise in the sea level, then we are likely to have more of a stair-stepping. And I submit that we need to be able to take those kinds of projections into account as well. For the hurricane storm surge for this particular project, we wanted to generate future floodplains, future 100 and 500 year floodplains. And since we worked with FEMA and developed the coastal inundation model for Alabama and the Florida Panhandle, and we had access to the same kind of data for Mississippi, we decided to take this uh, similar approach to our future floodplain assessments. So we down-selected from the 295 synthetic storms that were used for the Alabama Florida Panhandle study by looking at the return periods and, and the surge hikes by, by going back to the joint probability method with optimal sampling and down-selecting only those storms that generated 100 and 500 year floodplains. The result is that we're able to estimate return period still water extents 
that are a function of the coastal dynamics of sea level rise. Our new project, which we just got underway at the end of last year, we've uh, coined the acronym NGOM plus N2E2. N2E2 because we're incorporating natural and nature-based features along with an economic impact analysis and an ecosystem services valuation. So just as an example, looking in the lower left at the Apalachicola region, we can assess the marsh biomass productivity. We can assess the hurricane storm surge impact and various quantities associated with that. And we can now do this for proposed nature-based features. So maybe it is proposed to do thin layer disposal when dredging is, is done in this region, do thin layer disposal over the marsh. Maybe it's proposed that we do more nourishment of the dunes. And this approach will allow us to be able to uh, assess trade-offs between ecosystem services valuations provided by the marsh and the economic impact that occurs whether the marsh is there or whether the marsh is not there. You'll look or you'll notice again we're focused on these HUCs, these hydrologic unit codes. We're doing this over all of these hydrologic unit codes so that someone that's well removed from the coast can begin to appreciate how their tax dollar that's going to support thin layer disposal over the marsh or dune nourishment is actually beneficial to them in that they're likely to have less hurricane storm surge with an extreme event. And then we'll also be doing this with nuisance flooding as well. My concluding remarks are relatively simple. One that we all ought to know, and that is with respect to the climate, we lo no longer have the luxury of stationarity. I hope in this brief talk, I've shown that uh, we can model this dynamic system. And we have the basis of a system of systems, if I haven't shown that already. And we can do this at amazing scales. If you would have asked me back in 1980, if we were gonna be able to put, build a model like this, it was inconceivable. Climate change is a generational problem. We can address it, but we can't will it away. It's here and we have to work with it. But I think the most important point that I'd like to make is our numerical modeling technology is awesome. It really is. But with respect to climate change, the models only serve as advanced diagnostic tools. We're not making predictions about the future. We're providing information for the policymakers to make informed decisions. Few directly related publications that came out of that project and some acknowledgements. Thank you for your time and Jai, thank you for this opportunity to present. So Robert Nichols, um, I'm just curious about stakeholders because um, uh, what kind of time scales were they really interested in? You know, you mentioned 2100. In my experience, often it's maybe a bit shorter than that. And also you mentioned two meters of change. I sometimes find resistance to these large scenarios. I'm interested in your sort of take on what they, what they were sort of most interested in. So, it's a very insightful question and it really gets to the point. And I have to say that my answer disappoints me because the majority of the coastal resource managers that, that we worked with 
really what they're interested in is affecting change within their career. And their career span is 10 or 15 years. They're in a, you know, they, they've already been at it for 15 or 20 years. They've got 10 or 15 more years left and they want to do something that they can see the results from. And the problems that we face, as I said, are, are generational. We have to go back to what made us a great nation. I, I'm sorry, I'm not running for office, but it's, <laughs> it's the truth. My great, great grandfather didn't come to the United States and cut trees down and pull the stumps out so that he could be wealthy and have a great life. He did that so that I would have an opportunity to get higher education. I really believe that. He had a generational vision and people back then did. And so, Robert, it's, it, it is the case that they are looking at 10 or 15, but we were able to encourage them to consider 50 and 100 years into the future. And as far as two meters, well, forgive me, I show the most dramatic, but we looked at low, intermediate, low, intermediate, high and high, and, and the, the low was a crazy low of 20 centimeters, just the linear interpolation of the last 150 years onto 2100. The intermediate low is just a modest increase in sea level expansion or, or in ocean expansion. The intermediate high actually starts to take into account some glacial melt, but very little at that. And it is a, a rise of 1.2 meters. And the two meter is just a little bit more of glacial melt. Well, a, a lot more than we have at present because at present, the sea level rise that we've seen over the last 150 years is 90, 95% of that is just thermal expansion of the seas. And if we have two meter rise by the year 2100, then about 80% of the contribution is gonna come from glacial melt. So I personally think it's still conservative, but the manager of the Apalachicola National Estuary and Research Reserve really doesn't want to show the results to her, her uh, locals. Sorry if I took a long to answer. I was just wondering about the, um, the results you showed for the Northern Gulf of Mexico modeling. Did I understand that you're modeling the devolution of the shoreline and the barriers and the dunes, or was that? You did, but not me. And with a project like this, it is really wonderful that you not only have co-PIs, but you'll have scientists who, if you gain their respect, they'll begin to contribute to the project. And, and two that are of great importance are Rob Thieler, and Nathaniel Plant. Uh, Rob Thieler is at uh, Woods Hole with USGS and Nathaniel Plant is at St. Pete uh, with the USGS. And they developed a Bayesian network approach. And that provided a reasonable, based on historical data, their Nathaniel and uh, his scientist who used to be my PhD student are working with us on the new project and they're building more numerical modeling into the Bayesian network. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Scott, very much. It was a great talk. Um, So it's poster time. And remember what my dad says, vote early, vote often. But remember, the vote, we're going to only see and have uh, talked about 50% of the posters. The other 50% comes tomorrow. So you're voting not 